right, here we go. Day 10, a third of the way through the 30 days of risk and insurance uh, vlog that we're doing. This is Matthew Struck with Treadstone Risk Management. Um, when last I left you, we were talking about severe weather, uh, hurricanes, nor'easters, tornadoes. So uh, this is kind of related to that topic. This is the follow through on flood insurance. And so the first thing I'm going to tell you about flood insurance is anyone who has told you that your house or your business or your property is not in a flood zone is lying to you. Um, every single property in the United States is in some form of a flood zone. Now, uh, what, what varies is how often that property or that location uh, is expected to flood. So you might be in an area that's only expected to flood once every 1,000 years or, you know, over 500 years. Uh, or you might be in an area that's expected to flood once every 25 years or 100 years. And so all of that is going to determine how expensive the, flood, expensive the flood insurance is. But there's a huge misnomer out there in the industry when someone tells you, oh, no, no, you're in a... Uh, you're not in a flood zone. Um, what they're essentially trying to tell you is that you're in a low hazard flood zone that's not expected to flood anytime soon. But that doesn't mean that it's not going to flood. There's countless of situ countless number of situations where uh, houses that are in a you know an X flood zone uh, actually end up flooding. And uh, the homeowner was uh, caught by surprise because they felt, oh, well, I'm not in a flood zone. Um, but that didn't change the fact that their home got flooded. And a lot of those things can change over time, believe it or not. So um, the way flood zones are mapped out are done by the federal government, by, by FEMA. And uh, those flood zones are based off of elevations and topography in the maps. A lot of times it doesn't take into account natural water flows that are diverted or changed by development projects and whatnot. I can tell you from personal experience, my childhood home uh, was actually downstream from an area that was developed for a, uh, a golf course. And as you can imagine, a lot of square footage on a golf course uh, soaks up a lot of rain and they had to divert a lot of that rain and so it actually diverted into a drainage area that went right past my childhood home and as a result of that the the house was very low likelihood of flooding before they did that redevelopment but afterward it was almost inevitable that it was going to happen and that didn't necessarily change the the mapping of that property so that's one thing to remember the other thing to remember is that the big coverage in flood coverage is the building. A lot of people get wrapped up in the contents. They get worried about, um, you know, whether or not their belongings in the basement are going to be covered or whether or not when they finish the basement, the big screen TV is going to be covered. When truthfully, you know, insurance is there to really take care of catastrophic losses. And in the case of flooding, catastrophic losses happen when there's a compromise of the structure. Either the foundation gets pushed out by hydrostatic pressure, or there's big cracks and things like that. Or in some cases, like in Superstorm Sandy, a lot of the properties that were along the shoreline, the houses, if they sat on a slab, a lot of times either the slab or the house itself literally got picked up by the flood water and moved. And so that's really where flood insurance is of value, okay? So you, you can't go ahead and think of flood insurance and, and wonder whether or not it's going to cover your, your tchotchke collection or whatever that you have stored in the basement. What you really need to be concerned about is whether or not it's going to cover the big structural damage that might happen as a result of a really bad flooding event, all right? So the next thing that we're going to talk about is just in general, uh, some of the major flood zones that are out there, okay? So <clears throat> the one that a lot of people have heard of is an X zone. Sometimes it could also be a C zone. These are typically the non-special flood hazard areas or the low risk areas, okay? And essentially, the, the FEMA definition is that they're outside the 500-year floodplain, meaning they're not expected within the next 500 years to have a flood, flooding event. Or let me rephrase that, not necessarily within the next 500 years, but over any 500-year period of time, they're not expected to flood. But if you're at 499, uh, that means that it's reasonably expected that it's going to flood within a handful of years after you're, you know, at that location or at that point in time. 
So the next one is an A zone. So a zone A is the first special flood hazard area zone, and that basically has a 1% annual chance of flooding, meaning 1 in 100. And the reason why A, so there's A and AE, all right? So A is 1% chance of flooding without a known base flood elevation, whether the measurements just aren't known at that time or they're in flux. Um, there's no known base flood elevation, meaning where the waters are expected to crest, essentially, okay? An AE zone has the same 1% chance, but that base flood elevation is known. It's a quantified uh, elevation, and a lot of times those elevations are used to not only price your flood insurance, but also to define building codes and things like that moving forward within a municipality or a county. All right, so the last one I'm going to talk about is a V, which is known as the velocity zone or a tidal flood zone. And those are usually the, the properties or the locations that are located right near a tidal body of water. And as you can imagine, flooding from water coming up from the ground is a little bit different than water coming in from uh, the coastline. And that's why they have a special flood zone specifically for tidal is because there are different uh, concerns or risks of loss associated with tidal risks, okay? Uh, typically when water seeps up from the ground, uh, you're just going to get water. You might get a little bit of hydrostatic pressure, but it's typically not going to be too bad because that water is going to disperse pretty easily. Whereas a velocity or a tidal flood zone has some force and some momentum behind it, which can you know run into a house and knock a house off a foundation or compromise the foundation uh, and cause a different type of damage than the other type of flood zones. All right, so where are the major areas that you can get flood insurance from? Um, you know, I mean, your first option is just don't buy it, <laughs> in which case uh, a lot of people, um, I, I, I typically have a conversation with someone when they say, oh, well, you know, I didn't buy flood insurance. I say, okay, well, you're self-insuring that risk. And they said, no, 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 I didn't buy any insurance. And I said, yeah, that's exactly correct. If your house floats away, who has to pay for it? Um, and if the answer is there's no one except you and your wallet, well, guess what? You're self-insuring that risk. So the other place, two places that you can get flood insurance from, the major places are the NFIP, which is the National Flood Insurance Program. That's the federal program that's set up in partnership with um, FEMA uh, and some other offices that are at the out of Washington, D.C. And uh, essentially they try and spread the risk, meaning there's some subsidizing of the cost. So if you're in a really high cost area, the homes that pay for flood insurance that are in a low cost or a low risk area help to offset those really high costs that you might be paying. Now that being said, with recent storms such as Superstorm Sandy, the uh, NFIP, because of uh, major actuarial issues, meaning they, they had problems with the amount of money that was coming in versus the amount of damages that they had to pay, uh, they're actually beginning to cut back on the amount of subsidizing. And so that means that this second option is actually becoming a little bit more possible or competitive or economic, economical for uh, really high-risk flood zones, and that is private flood insurance. So just the way you would buy a homeowner's insurance policy or you would buy a auto policy from a company like a Travelers or a Hartford or a Nationwide, uh, this flood insurance can be purchased um, the same way. So the, the federal government isn't involved in it, though they still have to set rates and, and uh, make sure to get their pricing approved and whatnot. But it is uh, a, a decent alternative, or, or at least an alternative, to the federal program. So what are the, the benefits and the drawbacks of both? Well, I talked about the subsidizing in the federal program. That's the real main benefit. Um, uh, kind of an indirect or secondary benefit that you can't really rely on, but it's there, is the fact that because it's the federal government, if they do run out of funding, they can just go back and, you know, take more money from elsewhere in the federal budget and try and repurpose it to pay for damages and things like that. The drawback is that the coverage <clears throat> uh, isn't really amazing. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of uh, like having basic coverage, but it doesn't really cover anything too extravagant. 
um, anything that's below base flood elevation in, in an area that has a base flood elevation, it's only going to cover really the main components of the house, the electrical system, the water heater, uh, the uh, HVAC system, um, any of the main components, the, you know, the piping and, and water system within the house, and, and then a couple of other like very ancillary things like uh, um, you know, microwaves or appliances and things like that that might be installed and used down there if someone has a kitchen or something. Uh, the, the real coverage only really kicks in, the, the, the better coverage part, only really kicks in for the floors that are above the base flood elevation. And that's because they reasonably don't expect those floors to flood, essentially. Um, the other big drawback is that <clears throat> the federal program is uh, rated or, or basically the way they pay their claims is off of something called actual cash value. So if anyone's ever had an auto claim and the, you know, the cost to repair uh, the vehicle ends up uh, being more than the vehicle's worth, they total the vehicle, right? And the amount of money that you get isn't the full amount of, you know, what you purchase the vehicle for. It's what they consider was the remaining value in the vehicle. So they depreciate it over a period of time that you've owned it and over the life of that vehicle. So the same thing applies with the federal program. If you have damages, they're only going to pay you actual cash value, meaning they're going to depreciate the value. They're not going to necessarily give you the amount of money that you need in order to replace what was damaged. So uh, that's one of the big drawbacks of the federal program. That's one of the positives of the private insurance market is the private insurance market can actually get you replacement cost coverage, which will pay to replace the things with like kind and quality. Uh, that um, you know you've lost or had damage during a flooding event. The other big drawback for the uh, federal program is that there's no business interruption coverage. Okay, so this doesn't really affect homeowners, but it really affects businesses and other kinds of organizations that have routine flows of income or revenue or fees every week or every month. Uh, if your property gets flooded out. And as a result of it, during the rebuilding and the cleaning process, you can't take in revenue or get those fees or get rent from tenants. The federal program isn't going to reimburse you. Uh, they're going to say, we're sorry, we don't cover that. Whereas in the private insurance market, they will actually pick up that, that exposure. Um, and so private insurance typically costs a little bit more because it covers more. It's better. But that being said, a lot of people are already very price conscious about flood coverage because they don't want to buy it in the first place. Um, I would tell you that <clears throat> even in an X zone, which is, again, that low hazard zone, it's worth buying because it's almost like credit. When you don't want it uh, or you don't need it, it's plentiful and it doesn't cost that much. When you really need it, it costs a lot. Um, and typically when you need it is <laughs> right after a flood event because FEMA will come in and they'll give you 70 cents on the dollar if you didn't have coverage. But guess what? They're going to tell you that they're not going to cover anything that you should have had covered by the main flood insurance policy from the federal program. And so as a result of that, you're going to have to then go out and get flood insurance so that you can get whatever is left over that FEMA is going to kick you back money for. So, um, you know, it's a very valuable piece of any insurance and risk management plan that's out there. Okay, so we're going to talk about some flood mitigation uh, recommendations. So uh, having flood insurance is kind of step one, all right? Step two is thinking a little bit more holistically about, all right, even if we have insurance, how do we stop claims or reduce the cost of flood claims, all right? So the first one is thinking about the location of your building. Uh, is it located in a high hazard flood area? Do you have the availability to move? Are you just leasing the location? And you don't have to cover the building, but your stuff is at risk of flooding. Can we move somewhere else and just as, a co just as cost effective, get a space that's not in such a high hazard area for flood insurance, all right? Um, the second one is research flood mitigation uh, renovations that you can make to your property. So those renovations, the, the real big one, two big ones, are uh, elevating the property. So if you've ever seen buildings that are on stilts or they have 
basically carports underneath the buildings uh, that are not necessarily livable space, but parking spaces. And uh, they elevate the first floor of the building above where it's expected to flood. That's a way of mitigating the risk of that first floor flooding. The other one is flood venting. So flood venting is something that can actually get you, um, I, I think elevating your property can do it too. But flood venting could actually get you a really nice reduction in the cost of your flood insurance from the federal insurance program, um, as much as 70% in some cases. And essentially what flood venting is, if you're unfamiliar, um, if you have a house that has a crawl space underneath, so it doesn't have a basement or anything like that, it, it essentially has a, an empty space underneath the house. And uh, if you put these little kind of like flapper valves in the front and back, of the foundation where, and this typically happens in tidal zones along the shorelines. Um, as the water comes in, the flapper valve will actually flip open on the front, the water will run through the crawl space, and then on the back end of the house it'll do the same thing. The flapper valve will open and the water will flow up and flow out. And the reason why they actually give you a huge discount on your insurance is because that reduces dramatically the amount of hydrostatic and tidal force that gets put on the foundation of the house, and that dramatically reduces the likelihood that the house will either get picked up and carried away, or that the foundation or the, the structural supports will be compromised as a result of the flooding. Uh, the next thing that you could do is actually <clears throat> things that you could do internally within the house. So uh, a lot of houses have their utilities and their main components in the basement or on the ground level. So something that you can do to protect those is, especially if whatever that low point is where they're located, if that's below the base flood elevation, you can elevate those. So things like electrical panels, if they're sitting near the ground, those should go as high up on the wall as you can by code. Um, something like your water heater or your HVAC system, if it's located low in the house, at the very least you can put it on top of a shelf, basically. Um, and the shelf acts as a little bit of a step um, to uh, get those components higher up so that maybe if you get flooding, <clears throat> the water stays at ground level within, within that floor of the building, but it doesn't necessarily reach the components that are elevated. If anyone's ever heard of the Fukushima reactor situation that they had in Japan, part of the problem that they had was their reserve generators were not elevated. They should have been on tall platforms to be up above the water level, but they weren't. They got washed away, and as a result of that, they had no reserve power, and that's why they melted down. All right, and so the last thing I'm going to talk about is just consult your insurance and risk management professional. They probably have some good ideas on other ways that you could either mitigate the risk or also... Um, you know, include flood insurance or some kind of flood protection coverage within your insurance and risk management program. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all I got on flood insurance. Uh, day 10 out of the way or a third of the way done, 20 days left. Uh, please hit subscribe, like, share it, send us your comments or make comics, comments down below. And we're going to keep pumping these out. See you on day 11.